Okay, we're recording. So it's all on the record now, just so everybody's warned. What I'm going to do, um, I'm going to actually mute everybody except for Scott and whoever's talking. And I'm going to suggest mm -hmm. that you all put, put it on the speaker view rather than so that you get the close up of Scott when he's teaching or, or Ethan when he's leading the Compline at the end. Okay, so I'm going to mute everybody real quick. <clears throat> Such power that I have. Okay. You all are muted. I'm going to unmute Scott or ask him to unmute himself. Great. Welcome everybody to Court 9 uh, on Zoom, Faith Works. Um, it's exciting. It's great to see all of you, even as a little square on Zoom. Just a couple things at the beginning. Um, one, the first part of our time tonight will be Scott teaching. He's going to give an overview of the book of James. Um, most Scott, you can say anything about yourself you want to say. Scott is a canon in our new diocese, which I realize means we're going to have a double-barreled canon. Jay and Scott both print them up. You're all muted, so I couldn't hear you laugh uproariously. Um, but I'm grateful for, for Scott's teaching and his ministry and excited to hear him um, share with us kind of an overview of James to get our series started. At the end of our time tonight, though, that last 15 minutes or so of the hour, we're going to close with a time of prayer together of Compline. Many of you have joined our Wednesday night prayer, prayer times, and I um, was excited for the feedback to, that said people wanted to continue that. And I love that we get to study the Bible and then we get to pray together um, out, out of that time. Um, I think that's all I will say. Again, I recommend you put your um, Zoom into speaker view now. And if you have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat. So if we have time for questions, then they're already there. Great, let me pray. And then Scott, we'll turn it over to you. Father, thank you so much for this um, dear community of believers, these people that you love and that we love. And I pray that this time of studying the Bible together would increase our love for you and our love for one another and our love for our neighbor. Please bless Scott now. Um, he's doing so much on Zoom. We pray that this would be a joy for him and something that fills him up even as he pours out to us. So we thank you. And in your name we pray, amen. All right, take it away, Scott. Okay, so am I on now? You can hear me? Okay. Um, you know, James is one of these letters that a lot of people like in the New Testament, and uh, there's good reasons for it. Um, one of the, uh, I, I like to ask certain questions about the book of James. Uh, my first one is, uh, I think James is the brother of Jesus. All right, now, we can debate about what the word brother means. Uh, here, but what's it like to go to school, to shul, when your older brother is the Messiah? You know, and what's it like to write a letter like this uh, when some of you have had older siblings uh, who went to school before you? What's it like to be a writer in the Jerusalem church as a leader that James is when? People believe in your brother, and they're listening to you. Um, I think this puts James in a rather unique situation. Um, what's it like to be a Jewish believer in Jerusalem in the first century when there are many of your Jewish friends and family members who are not believers and who don't think this Messiah that you're claiming to be is the Messiah is the real Messiah? Uh, th these are questions, I think, that have to um, come alongside us as we're looking at this short letter. Uh, what's it like uh, to be oppressed, to be persecuted, to suffer uh, in various ways in first century Jewish culture uh, for believing that someone is the Messiah when most people don't believe that person is the Messiah? And another question, um, I can't read my writings here. How do, how do you communicate, how do you communicate to Jewish believers the way James does in a way that affirms that Jesus is the Messiah without offending everybody and still giving off the impression that you are uh, observant of the Torah and the law. Those are, these are some of the questions. You know, James only mentions Jesus twice. And I have a friend who's written, 
greatest commentary ever on James. His name is Dale Allison. He knows more about, he's forgotten more about James than all of us others have ever learned. And Dale is, um, he's at Princeton. He is not convinced that this letter was a Christian letter. It was kind of edited to make it more Christian. And, and that is um, a sign for me of how Jewish this letter is and how it sounds. It's very, very Jewish. So this is, this is a part of this letter that I think we could appreciate. Uh, we could appreciate it probably, um, we could appreciate it more if we think uh, of the community south of us in Highwood, in Highland Park, uh, because this is the sort of teaching that uh, a Jewish community uh, today could listen to and say, yeah, that's, that's the way we think. We, we like these ideas. Almost every letter, every verse in the book of James is acceptable to Jews today, except you don't get a letter from the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ in 1-1, and 2-1 is a little even stronger. My brothers and sisters, in, uh, believers, in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we must not show favoritism. So other than those two verses, uh, Everything in this letter basically works for first century Jews. So this is um, uh, some questions that I ask about the Jewish context of the letter. And the other side is um, this letter is written to Jewish believers. James's language is not entirely clear when he says to the 12 tribes in the diaspora, which is outside of Israel. So people debate about uh, each one of these expressions, who he's talking about. Um, so, and then the other thing I wanted to make in general, uh, an observation is uh, we have to learn to read James as a letter written by James and not by the Apostle Paul. This is not like Romans. This is not like 1 Corinthians. This is not a logical argument rooted in soteriology. It's just the way James talks and this is the sort of language I think we would hear in any first century Jewish community of faith that believed in Jesus. This, this is the way they talked. This is the kind of language they used, and this is the kind of beliefs that they had. So there's no structure to the letter. Um, I've, I've wrestled with all my friends who've written stuff on the structure of James, and I think None of it is convincing, although I do think maybe if, if you're reading the book of James from chapter 3, verse 1, where James starts talking to teachers and says that they will have a greater judgment, all the way through 4.12, uh, which is the sort of the end of a section, I think that could be addressed to those in the community who were leaders and teachers. Uh, but other than that, he just brings up themes and topics and then drifts off of these topics. So those, that, that's, a, that's just a little quick oversight. I'll stop here to see if you have any questions about what I've said. Uh, if not, I'll mute you so that you can't ask questions so that I can go on. Look at that. I have a Beautiful. quick question. Yes because somebody has to. Um, you've talked about this as a letter. I've heard sometimes it being referred to as a sermon, as, as James as a sermon. Um, do, do you think of it really as, as a letter or is there some, some case for it being a different? And does it matter? Uh, I would say no, it doesn't matter for the content, but the form of the, of the book, when it says James, a servant to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings, that is, that's letter. That is the form of how letters began in the ancient world. So James wants us to think of it as a letter, but from that point on, it, it doesn't sound like a letter. It's like he's heard that Paul's writing all these letters uh, and he thinks, I'm, I'm gonna get in on that game. I'm gonna write a letter too. I'm gonna see how it works. Uh, but really from that point on, you know, you don't get any of those greetings like Paul, you don't, have a Thanksgiving and anything like the Pauline letters from that point on. It just doesn't sound like Paul. 
So it could be a sermon. It's sermonic. It's uh, preachy. All right. All right. One, one, one of the things about James that um, I'd like to look at, and I'm going to, I'm going to see if this works, Amanda. I'm going to share my screen. Host disabled screen sharing. Let me work on that for a second, Scott. Okay. All right. When, when you read the book of James and you, um, you are familiar with the synoptic gospels, and um, I will... Uh, some of you don't know this, but my first 12 years of my teaching career, I taught at Trinity, and about all I taught were the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, I didn't do anything in Paul. Uh, there were other heavyweights at the, in the department who thought they, all the students should have them on Paul, and I wasn't one of them. And I taught Matthew. I taught the teachings of Jesus. I taught discipleship. I taught the Synoptic Gospels. I taught James. Well, here's an interesting feature. No book of the New Testament sounds more like Jesus, especially the Gospel of Matthew, than the book of James. But here is the astounding feature about it, is that James doesn't ever quote Jesus. He just sounds like Jesus. And this is, this is um, a, a marvelous lesson, I believe, that he was so absorbed with his, let's, let me call him, his older brother's teachings that he could not write without sounding like Jesus. Now that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good compliment, I think. I mean, and um, there's discussions about this and there's uh, pretty well a, a strong consensus so I want to give you a, a couple examples of this. One of the words that James likes is the word perfect. Now, uh, Doug Moo, okay, screen sharing. I can use screen sharing now. Where is it? Where'd it go? Something happened here. I lost. I think Marianne is accidentally sharing her screen. Yeah, Marianne is sharing screen. Down at the bottom, Marianne. You should have a green, little green button. Scott, you should be able to share on top of her now. Okay. There we go. I'm trying to. All right. Here we go. Where did this go? Now, how do I find this? See if this works. Share. Can you see James now? Yes, it's working. Okay. All right. Uh, the translations don't work for this. They don't use the word perfect as often as they ought to. But in James chapter 2, verse 22, which I have right here, this is about the famous justification by faith passage. You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made perfect by what he did. Perfect. Now, this is a word that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 548, if you, you know, um, if you want to be perfect, you have to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, be, be perfect as your heaven, as your father in heaven is perfect. And in Matthew 1921, which sounds like James as well, where Jesus says to the rich young ruler, if you want to be perfect, go sell everything you've got and give to the poor. So this word perfect. Uh, is found in the book of James in chapter 1, verse 4, in verse 17, in verse 25, and in chapter 2, 22, and in chapter 3, verse 2, where James says this. Now, if you can see down here at James 3, 2, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect. There's that word perfect translated uh, as perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. So James has a, a fascination with the word perfect as a measure of someone who is the kind of Christian he's looking for. Now, another example that I'd like to draw your attention to is James chapter 1, verses 22 to 27. 
and you'll have to agree with me that this sounds like Jesus. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This, this sounds like Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, where Jesus completes the Sermon on the Mount, and he tells that cute little story that at least we sang when I was a child uh, in Sunday school class, and we, then we all fell down. Um, the, the really odd thing is falling down is, uh, is Jesus' language for the judgment of God against people who have heard his teachings and not done it. Uh, so this is, um, this is the language, this sounds like Jesus, it echoes what Jesus says, but yet James has made it his own. Uh, one, one little point that is, that is interesting to me, uh, I learned this from a South African professor. In James 1.27, James says, religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless. So this is, the ultimate form of religion and pious practices for James. And this would be um, observant religion for James in a Jewish world, is to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Now think about this. An orphan for you and me is someone, uh, okay, now I'm gonna stop to share. To share. An orphan for you and me is someone who doesn't have a mother and a father. But in the first century, an orphan was someone who had lost one parent. And this one is someone who has lost a father. And so therefore, who is left is a widow. Now think about this. This is James, the brother of Jesus, who is telling people that pure religion is something that I experienced as a boy when people cared for me and my brothers and for my mother. That's pure religion. And that is a really pretty remarkable statement. James knows this from his own life, that, that he had been given attention by other people in his Jewish community. And uh, so this is, I think this is a little window and um, if that interpretation is not right, I'm not going to change my mind because I really like it. And so, and I think it, I think it's right. Um, uh, one more, and that is I'll screen share again. See if I can do this. And uh, let's see, do we have James back up again, Amanda? Yes, we do. Okay, James two eight to nine. This is one of my favorite parts of James. If you really keep the royal law, now James mentioned this in chapter 125. He called it the, the perfect law that gives freedom. But in chapter two, he says, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. You're doing tov, all right? But if you show favoritism, you, you sin and are convicted by the law as a, as a lawbreaker. Now, this is very interesting because James has now talked about, he's now talked about a law that brings freedom, and now he calls it um, a perfect law. And you have to ask, what, what did he mean by this? And what he quotes is the second half of what I call the Jesus Creed, where Jesus taught his disciples that the essence of following Jesus of following God, of observing the Torah, was to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And James thinks that the perfect law of freedom 
And what he says in James 2, 8 to 9, is the royal law, which would be the most significant law in the whole Bible, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is not a common verse quoted in Jewish texts. It is not a common verse quoted in Jewish ethical texts. So where did James get this one? Well, he was one day wandering by, uh, maybe in Capernaum, going down to visit his brother to see what he was up to lately. And he heard Jesus talking about loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. James has embraced this. Now, all I want to say here is when you read James, you're going to hear echoes of Jesus. And I think what's the most remarkable is he never quotes him. He never says, my brother said this. He never said the Messiah said this. He never said, Jesus said this. He just sounds like Jesus. And that is a mark of discipleship. Okay, I'll stop there, see if there's questions. No questions, okay, all right. Wait just a minute, Scott. Yeah. I just think it's the most beautiful thing what you just shared. And I, I kind of want us to think about it a minute that he doesn't quote Jesus verbatim, but he's he's uh taken him into his self, mm -hmm. right? I mean he's like and and then it just kind of comes out. I, I just think that's a I don't know, it's just I've not heard that before about James in this way and um i would wish that for myself <laughs> i wish that for all of us i mean it's just a beautiful picture I, I thank you for sharing it that way yeah hmm. i mean the last the only thing that jesus gets close I mean, james gets close to quoting jesus is right at the end he says this is really an odd way James 5.12, oh, let's see, I, I, I'll just read it. Above all, this is near the end of the letter, above all. Now you're waiting for a capsule summary. You're waiting for somebody to put it all together and he says, do not swear. <laughs> Whoa, that is a surprise. Not by heaven or by earth or anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. Yeah. Well, that, um, not yeah. by heaven, not by earth, that, that's almost a quotation from the Sermon yeah. on the Mount. But that's as close yeah. as we get. The rest of it is just so yeah. deeply embedded in his mind, yeah. his heart, that when he talks, he sounds like his brother. Yeah. I think that's pretty beautiful. Cool. Yeah. I might have missed something you said earlier because my mom called me and I needed to take that call, but... What do we want to say about the conversion of James? Did you talk about that at all? I mean, do we know anything about that? I mean, because it seems like that came later, right? Maybe for him? Yeah, all, I mean, I think, I think we know very little. Um, we do know in the Gospel of John that one time Jesus is going to Jerusalem and his brothers give him a hard time. Yeah. And uh, John tells us that they didn't believe. Right. Well, the next time we have the brothers, you know, we have uh, indication of James being present um, after the resurrection. So we, you got to think, you got to think that Jesus experienced resistance mm -hmm. in his own household. I mean, Mary, Mary seems to be giving Jesus a bit of a hard time in John chapter two at Cana. Yeah. Do yeah. something about the wine. I mean, yeah. even stronger in Mark chapter three. Uh, they come they come down to Capernaum. That's a two or three day walk. They come down to Capernaum and someone tells uh, someone at Peter's house, I think tells tells uh, Jesus that your you know your family's at the door. <laughs> and Jesus says, well, if they want to come sit down, they can come sit down and be one of my disciples and sit in the circle. And that's it. Yeah. So uh, we don't we don't really have uh, anything about his conversion, no. but um, he prayed to receive Jesus into his heart according to the four spiritual laws, 
when he was 14 years old. <laughs> that's all we know. Well, there's a great hopefulness about the journey here, right? Yeah, that, that's, that's right. wonderful. Yeah, all he, right, thank uh, you. He resisted. Yep. Okay. Um, now, uh, I want to mention some of the themes because Amanda uh, has an outline for the weeks that come on the themes. And uh, there's a, there are different ways to approach James. Uh, you can just kind of say he's got um, random thoughts about really cool topics, or you can try to gather them through a lens. I don't think James is very cooperative if you try to uh, colonize him into a, a thought. But one of the thoughts that works is if you look at that great wisdom passage in James 3, 13 to 18, Wisdom cannot, cannot kind of hold the letter together. The wisdom of James in teaching people what it means to be a Jewish Christian in a difficult environment. Remember, um, these, these are Christians who are oppressed. So he talks about, here are some of the themes he talks about. He talks about testing. He brings this up right away. And... Um, Without any clarity, he says in James chapter 1, verse 2, consider it pure joy, or all joy would be a more literal translation, whenever you face trials or testings of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Well, what kind of testing does he have in mind? Uh, as you read the letter, you realize that this group of Christians, uh, one of the most common topics James brings up about them is financial stress. It's really serious. And yet James uses the language of his brother here in chapter one, verse nine, believers in humble circumstances, uh, these are poor, this is the poor, ought to take pride in their high position. This is just like Jesus, to turn things upside down. The rich should take pride in their humiliation. So now he has posed the poor versus the rich. Well, that, that might be the test. And it becomes really clear in chapter 2 that that seems to be, the, if not the test, at least one of the major tests that his community is following. So I want to look at this little text in James chapter 2, and I will share the screen, and then click this on. This is, I think this is, uh, this is the best window, or this is the second, one of the two best windows into the community. In James 2.1, James says, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. This is... Uh, favoritism toward the rich. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. Now, this is just nothing other than a stereotype, and James wants a caricature so that he can make his point strong. If you show special attention, this is the expression is to, to uh, look at his face, if you look at the face of the man wearing fine clothes and say, now here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The answer to that is yes. James now digs in. Listen, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith. That goes right back to that those verses in James 1. And to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Now look at this. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they, the answer is yes. Are they not the ones you are dragging, who are dragging you into court? Yes. Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong. Now those, that is really strong. And I know that Dana is going to look at this passage. I think Dana's on schedule for this. 
at the end of James chapter 4, James says in 4.13, uh, he takes on business traveling, business merchants traveling. Listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, he says. Then he turns in uh, with a very similar expression in chapter 5, verse 1. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted. Skip down uh, to verse 4. Look, the wages you failed to pay, the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Well, well that is really strong language. This is especially strong for the guy who tells people that how you talk is a measure of your maturity in James chapter 3, verse 1. So this is biblical prophetic language, assaulting the rich in favor of the poor. Liberation theologians call this the preferential option for the poor. James is in that category. And this is a very strong text in one of the great little commentaries on James is by Elsa Thomas, who uh, comes at it from a Latin American sort of liberation theology perspective. And she pays attention to these texts very carefully. But James 1 brings up testing. James 1, 8 to 9 seems to clarify that the 10, 9 through 11 is the testing about finances. James 2 makes it really clear that these believers in Jesus are being oppressed by the rich. And then James goes after them in 4.13 for the businessmen who, uh, and these are probably, these might not even be believers. It's hard to know, but in uh, James 5, he really goes after those who are oppressors. So this, this is the world of James. That's why I ask, what is it like to be oppressed when you are a Jewish believer and other, believer, other Jews don't believe? And what's it like to be an oppressed Jew in that context for thinking that Jesus is the Messiah? Well, one of the things that it's like is that they were financially oppressed. They were probably not paid their wages, and they had become manual laborers. So that's, that's the real world of first century Jewish Christianity. Well, that's just one point I was going to cover. All right, now, let me cut a couple other things. There's hearing and doing. This is really big to James. Uh, and that wonderful passage in James 1.22, uh, where he, he's really big on, if you hear these things, don't just think you've got a seminary degree. You have to live these things. You have to do these things. And what he's talking about. He's really big on speech. And I gave a lecture to my doctoral class with Dan Hanlon on the significance of James 3, 1 to 4, 12 about speech patterns for how we operate with social media. And uh, James has some really, I don't know who's going to cover those passages, Amanda. Uh, but those are some really strong words on, uh, that can apply for social media. James talks about wisdom in a beautiful passage in James 3, verses 13 to 18. It's a glorious uh, description of wisdom. And um, he talks about these uh, wealthy business leaders along with testing. So those are the major themes in the book of James. Um, it's practical every verse. Is about living uh, before God. As a Jewish believer in the first century, when you're in trouble for being a Jewish believer, it's it's real. Scott, you and I could go back and forth all night. So I forgive me for jumping in again, but I know you just did a recent translation of this. Yeah. So was there anything about this that jumped out at you that was new for James in the translation? I'm just curious. 
Well, I've, you know, I've worked with the Greek text of James for a long time. So, but, it, you know, I've tried to be consistent with other uh, uh, books in the New Testament. Um, here, here's something that this bugs me. It, it probably doesn't matter. It's one of those, it doesn't matter uh, questions that Amanda asked. His name is not James. His name is Jacob. Yeah. The, yeah. the Greek word is Jacobos. All right. Yeah. So this is a man whose father, I mean, this is a man whose name is after a patriarch of Israel. And when we translate as James, we lose all that connection. And Jesus' brothers, uh, we know he has four brothers. They all have patriarchal names. Mm. Um, so uh, I, I think that's, I think that deserves, and so I use the word Jacob. Well, yeah. we get this in the English tradition too when we talk about Jacobite, the Jacobite yes. kings, right? I mean, that's, that's right. it's that's James, James, right? Yeah, right. exactly. Okay. Yeah. I don't think, Jay, there was anything that jumped out of the text. I mean, it's very sophisticated Greek. Yeah. This okay. is some of the best Greek in the entire New Testament. But would Jesus' brother have Greek like that, do you think? I mean, what? I'm just curious what your thought is about that. Well, it's it's probably likely that he didn't write the letter. I mean, he would have had someone help him write it. Uh, okay. And he chose somebody with pretty sophisticated capacity in Greek. It's not, it's somebody who really knows his Greek well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, all, it's on par with the book of Acts, the pastoral epistles, Hebrews, 1 Peter, and James. Best Greek of the New Testament. So it's come under fire, right, from Luther. Yeah. Maybe from others. Is there any, I mean, is, have there been seasons where, like, James went into disrepute and then he's come back? Or, I mean, is there, you know, your thought about that in terms of the canon for him? Well, it was never really questioned in the canon. You know, I, I taught my students... Um, I think if you move from the Sermon on the Mount and you move from the Synoptic Gospels, as I did, into the book of James, what James says about justification in James 2, 20 to 26 is not one bit surprising. Mm. It's people who are so absorbed with Romans mm. and then have learned to read it in a, let's say, a Calvinistic or a Lutheran way and then develop the theology that's all around it, mm. that they get to James 2 and they go, whoa, this is a little tension. So I, I don't think it's a, it's a native tension. It's a, it's a foreign tension with James. Mm. Mm. And uh, so um, I often have told my students, those people who have trouble with, that think James is contradiction to Paul, have not studied Paul adequately. Yes, right. Thank you. He's I'll big on works. He's I'll be quiet on. now, but thank you. Scott, I, I have a question since everyone else is quiet at the moment. And that's, what would we miss if we didn't have James in the Bible? Um... What would we miss if we didn't have James? I think we would miss this uh, re, I'll call, I'll, I'll use the German expression first because it's such a great German word. The Vergegenwärtigung, the reactualization. Now, Dan Becker, you like that German word, right? Vergegenwärtigung, the reactualization of Jesus in a new context. We see how the, let's say, the moral vision of Jesus gets a new life in a new context for, for James. Um, I think we would miss uh, his strong language about speech patterns. This is a big deal in the book of James. Jesus talks about that by your words you will be judged, Matthew 15, Mark 7. But there's nothing as strong as James 3, 1 through 312, where he says the tongue is a poison and it sets for us on fire. I mean, there's, that's strong rhetoric and he, and he likes it. And then he turns it into 4, 1 through 12 and calls people about judging. So that, that's a, 
a strength of James that we don't really see anyone else bring to the fore. And I also think that, that James is correcting people who misread Paul when he talks about justification in 220 to 26. So I think that's a, a fresh thing. But he doesn't really have new, uh, unusual. He has a focus on things that have been maybe neglected a bit. You have a little over five more minutes before we're supposed to start prayer. What else, what else do you want to share? I'm sure you have like 10 pages of notes. I do have all, but I had all this long section about Jesus and the James and the wealth. Uh, wealth is a blessing tradition that he sort of attacks, but uh, that's really going to be someone else's uh, topic. Um, sure. Just, um, Echoing uh, what was said about you, what you said ab about discipleship, it it, uh, it it resonates with with what you wrote um, in the King Jesus Gospel, and and more recently in Jamar Tisby in uh, Rediscipling the White Church talks about what it means to be a disciple, and you you clarified that in King Jesus Gospel, and and as you just said, and I appreciated that he's he's balancing or correcting a misinterpretation of Paul. Um, you know, and, and it's it's very American to say it, it just depends what what someone believes, believe in Christ. But it's about yeah. discipling, which is a, a, a changing, a living, a, a, a mm. following in every step. Yeah, I mean, this is the great passage in James 1, um, 22. Do not merely listen to the word, do what it says. Do it, do it, yep. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is really big to James, but James... He's not just uh, talking about doing it. He, his focus is on a Jesus Creed-like uh, perception of Torah observance, which is to care for widows, orphans and widows in their distress, is that someone who is following the law properly through the lens of loving God and loving others, which James brings up in James 2, um, is someone who will have a sensitivity toward orphans and widows. Mm -hmm. And children so, at risk. So this James, as the, as the brother of Jesus, also the Bishop of Jerusalem. Yeah. Right. And so do we see so much pastoral stuff in this too, right? From him is yeah. leading this new, this new thing. Right. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, when you look at John 7 and John and uh, James's disbelief in Jesus at the time yeah. to, to this situation, and he, I mean, I think this is really important. And uh, to the degree that we would have Jewish believers is James is so sensitive to the Torah, to the law, mm -hmm. that the way he talks about the Christian life just doesn't sound Christian at times, according to our categories. Mm -hmm. It sounds very Jewish. And he's talking about the law as if, okay, you're supposed to follow the law. Mm -hmm. And that was early Jewish Christianity. They cared about the law. They didn't get rid of the law. Uh, yes, they followed the law by following Jesus, but that led them to a deeper perception and practice of the law rather than dispensing with the law. And I think we learn from James uh, a sensitivity to context, is that this is how Jewish believers lived then. My, my friends who are Messianic believers, uh, scholars, New Testament people, they all love the book of James. They think it's for them. They, they, they struggle with Romans, but they love the book of James. They think it's, for, it's very it ethical. Like, yeah. It's yeah. very ethical, right? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's the kind of thing that we've set aside in many ways yeah yeah god i'm gonna ask you one last question before we go to compline and that's this what do you hope that the holy spirit will do in our community as we study this book together this fall well you're asking for trouble 
Uh, James, James is convicting on everything that he talks about. On wealth, he, he pushes hard. On speech patterns, he pushes hard. And, uh, you know, Amanda and Jay, this is not surprising to you. I think that the way we talk on social media today is, uh, is in great need of discipleship. I'll just put it that way. About a radical conversion. There's so much outrage in our culture. Uh, stirred up by the algorithms in Facebook and Google and Twitter uh, to keep us there, addicted to that sort of behavior. James is gonna, he's gonna say this, you know, this, the tongue is a poison and it can set a fire, set a, a turn of fire and burn down forests. Um, so he's gonna talk about that. He's gonna talk about living a life of wisdom He's going to call into uh, call into question plans that are connected to the business world. Uh, he's going to call into question wages that are poured uh, that are paid to workers. All the I mean, every, James is going to convict, and I think if we're going to be listeners uh, to to the scriptures. Uh, we're, we're going to have to make changes, adjustments to live, to live this way. Thank you. Uh, Moe, you unmuted yourself. Did you want to ask a question? Or was, okay, was it, was it an accident? Okay. Scott, thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. Um, really grateful. And um, I was moved too by uh, what, what Jay pointed out to us about what it's like to just kind of exude Jesus, even when you're not quoting him. So that's what I'm taking away tonight. And I invite each of us to kind of think through what are the, what's the thing that we want to take away with us tonight. Um, we're going to turn now to Compline. I'm going to try to share it through my screen. And Deacon Ethan is going to lead us in that time of prayer. So Ethan, unmute yourself and show yourself. Here I am. Hey, everybody. Um, some of you who've been logging on for prayer on Wednesday nights the last few months have heard me say that um, Compline has been a great comfort for me in the uh, prolonged season we're in. Um, Compline is the nighttime service in the daily office and um, night is a scary time, uh, especially in centuries past. Think about what the world was like before electric light before streetlights. Um, at night, we're at our most vulnerable. So Compline is very aware of our vulnerability. It's a service that uh, reminds us who we are in Christ, and it's, it offers comfort uh, to us. The verse in a psalm we say tonight um, says, I lie down in peace, at once I fall asleep. For only you, Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Uh, Compline reminds us that the only light in the darkness is Christ. Um, we pray, be our light in the darkness, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from the perils and dangers of this night. Um, that darkness can be literal, but it's also the darkness of our own sin and certainly of the wickedness of the world around us. So Compline is a, a great comfort because it reminds us that the only light in the darkness and our only hope, our only confidence, is our Lord. So let's pray Compline together. If you have the liturgy pulled up, and we'll try and get you out of here as close to 8.30 as possible. The Lord Almighty grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Let's confess together. Almighty God, 
our Heavenly Father. We have sinned against you through our own fault in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. We say together, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let's say Psalm 4 responsibly. Um, I'll say the first half of the verse, and then we'll join together in the second half. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. You set me free when I am hard-pressed. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You mortals, how long will you dishonor my glory? How long will you worship dumb idols and run after false gods? Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. When I call upon the Lord, he will hear me. Tremble then and do not sin. Speak to your heart in silence upon your bed. Offer the appointed sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Many are saying, oh, that we might see better times. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when grain and wine and oil increase. I lie down in peace. At once I fall asleep. For only you, Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Be our light in the darkness, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And then my favorite Compline prayer, 
on the next page there. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous. And all for your love's sake. Amen. We finish with the Nunc Dimittis, which is the Song of Simeon, the, the prayer that Simeon offers when he meets the baby Jesus, which has usually been used in evening or night services in the tradition. Um, first with the antiphon, which we say together. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Let's say together the, the Nunc Dimittis too. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people, Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Thank you, Ethan. And thank you all for joining. Um, the recording, I'll try to make it available as soon as I can. Uh, next week, Dan Hanlon is making a recording, a teaching recording for us and sending it along. So he'll be our teacher and we'll probably have some discussion live as well. So I hope you can join us. Have a great night and see you sometime soon on Zoom. Thank you all. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you. That was fantastic.